Hello and welcome to Adler Astronomy Live. I'm Meredith, I'm your host, and today we're going to be talking about galaxies, but not just galaxies. We're going to be talking about the biggest galaxies in our universe. So we're so excited for today's program. Um, as many of you know, the Adler Planetarium is currently closed to the public. So because of that, we're trying to bring some of our programming into this online digital realm. And one of those programs that we're really excited about is some of the programs that we have in our space visualization lab. If any of you have actually been in our building, you might remember this room. It's a really cool room with a bunch of cool lights and videos playing. And it's a space in the museum where you can walk in and actually talk to a real live expert or astronomer about their field of science and see some really cool space visualizations to help back that up and also to help you just understand our universe a little better. So we're going to be bringing that to you today. And I'm really excited because we're going to do some like macro and micro looks at our universe, which is one of my favorite things to do in the SVL. Um, so as as you can see, we are just currently in our homes. We're not in the space visualization lab. And because of that, you might get some fun bonus features such as a technical difficulty or hearing weird noises from our neighbors or our family members or pets. Uh, for that, we just ask for your patience and understanding and we hope that you are ready to have some fun. Okay, I'm really excited to introduce our guest today um, because she's just a really delightful person, but also like really cool. And I'll, I'll talk more about her in a second, but everybody welcome Professor Louise Edwards. Hi, Louise. Hi, hi everyone. Great to be here. Where are you joining us from? I'm actually joining from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada today. I am at my mother's house uh, for the break. So exciting. The other day um, when we were meeting, I looked up Victoria, Canada on Google Maps and it looks like the most beautiful place in the world. I put on satellite view, a lot of mountainous terrain, a lot of water. I'm really jealous. Oh, we've Look been going on hikes, um, you know, throughout the week. It's been absolutely, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so lucky. Yeah, it's gorgeous. <laughs> I am biased because I was born and raised here, but it's still gorgeous. <laughs> Sounds amazing. It sounds like the most magical place on earth. Um, so I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> um, okay, let me read uh, Professor Louise Edwards' bio to y'all because it's literally one of the most impressive bios I've ever read. Um, so Louise Edwards is a Canadian astronomer working in the US. She has degrees from the University of Victoria, St. Mary's University, and Laval University, and has held teaching and research positions at Trent University, Caltech, Mount Allison University and Yale University. And she is currently a tenure track professor in the physics department at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. How amazing is that? And from what I've heard about San Luis Obispo, another stunningly beautiful place. So beautiful. I, you know, I think it's probably 80 degrees there today. I'm sure it's sunny. People are probably at the beach, you know, COVID permitting. <laughs> yeah, it's another gorgeous place. Oh my goodness. So when I read this bio, I not only am just so impressed with your stellar work, uh, but also just imagining all these beautiful places that you've gotten to live, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's been really exciting. At one point, I lived in um, 10 cities in 10 years in order to, you know, grab all the training and education that I needed to get here. <laughs> so it has definitely been a whirlwind. Um, whirlwind. <laughs> unreal. Um, okay, so as y'all can see, really impressive guest to have today. I'm really excited to ask your questions, your questions. Um, one more person I need to introduce, you will not see his face, he's behind the scenes, that's Aaron Geller. He's going to be running our visualizations today. So as we're speaking, he's going to be uh, seamlessly bringing up visualizations to help you to uh, see what we're talking about. Um, and also, today's program is meant to be totally interactive, which means we want to hear from you. We want you to ask questions to Luis. So please join us. Uh, Mike, he's going to be joining you in the chat today and uh, just wave hi to Mike, first of all, tell him who you are, where you're from and ask questions, any question. No question is silly. Uh, no question is too small or too big. Just ask him and Mike will get your questions over to me. I'll get your questions over to Luis. It's a beautiful thing. So please don't be afraid to ask questions today, um, especially because we're going to be talking about such cool concepts. Uh, and in fact, why don't we just dive right in? We're going to be talking about galaxies today and you know it, I, in my experience a lot of people sometimes have that question of like what's the difference between a galaxy and solar system and universe so why don't we just start local and why don't you just tell us Luis, what is a galaxy and also what's the milky way galaxy sure absolutely so a galaxy is any collection of stars you know planets moons um 
gas, dust, which will form new stars or come from old stars. Um, and then of course, dark matter that's all bound together and all feels um, the singular pull of gravity. That's a galaxy. And we live in a galaxy. Our own galaxy is a galaxy called the Milky Way. Um, so there are two types of galaxies. Uh, elliptical galaxies and spiral galaxies. And before we get into elliptical, elliptical galaxies, I thought we would talk a little bit more about spiral galaxies and our place in um, the universe. So if we start right here at Earth, if you're looking at this beautiful graphic here, here, imagine us as at Earth. And if we zoom out, we start to see a, um, a little circle around that represents the moon's orbit. So we're going to zoom out a little bit more. We're going to start to see those few stars around our star, sort of the local solar neighborhood. Um, we're still in the solar wow. system here. Zooming out. Look, Notice how much space we see, by the way, before we come to the next star, right? You know, there's light years between the sun and our, our next closest star. But finally, we start to see our neighboring stars still zooming out, still zooming out. And eventually, you know, we're starting to illustrate this gas and dust I was talking about here. And we see our corner of the Milky Way and that little white X there, that's located right at our position. And we have this beautiful illustration of what our own galaxy, the Milky Way looks like sort of from a bird's eye view. So cool. So there's a little you are here. I don't know if, it, if all you watching just love that as much as I do, but that is like my kind of thing. I love just zooming out and seeing where we are. As I mentioned earlier, I love looking at Google Maps, seeing where people are. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's just such a beautiful view. And um, I guess, you know, I, I, we're going to talk eventually about galaxies in more detail, but um, Andromeda is another special galaxy. And those of you who are avid astronomer, you know, astronomers watching from your backyards or um, beautiful dark skies, you may have seen Andromeda through a small telescope or through binoculars. It is the next closest. And it's also a spiral galaxy. Oh, amazing. I don't know if y'all heard, but my doorbell just rang. Uh, <laughs> um, actually, we just got a question, which is perfect segue into our next, uh, what you're about to show us, which my question from King Darius 2100 wants to know when the Milky Way and the Andromeda collide, which maybe you can talk a little bit about that, what that is happening. Uh, what are the chances that any two stars will collide? Yes. Oh my gosh. This is such a fantastic question. And, um, I'll answer it now, but we're also going to watch a couple of movies about how this happens, okay? So the, the spoiler, okay, the answer to your question is that maybe a handful of galaxies, okay? Out of the billions of star galaxies, stars, may out of the billions of stars in the Andromeda galaxy and the billions of stars in the spiral galaxy, there's just so much empty space. Remember I asked you to focus on the empty space? as we yes. are zooming out, there's just so much empty space compared to the size of each individual star that mostly it's just space hitting space or gas and dust hitting gas and dust. But individual stars may be a handful. Um, but we can get, I guess, a better look by looking. Yeah, wait, we have another question from Aviva um, from Chicago who wants to know what is that bright thing at the center of the Milky Way? Oh my gosh, yes. So um, if you remember the image we were looking up that we just zoomed out to, um, you can see some structure to these types of galaxies, again, which are called spiral galaxies. And the name of the galaxy, the spiral is from, see like um, um, on the outside, you sort of, we call these spiral arms, right? There's regions where you see a lot of gas and dust and stars. And you're noticing, Aviva, that right at the center, it's super, super, super uh, bright right? Yes. Those are actually just the accumulated glob of stars right there and some gas and dust as well, okay? So basically, um, even though the stars are very far away from each other and it's mostly empty space, we don't really notice how much empty space there is from a distance because the light from the individual stars travels right out out of the star. And so you have these, you know, you have all of this light around. So that's actually just the accumulation of all the light of all the stars, which are pretty densely, densely packed near the center of the galaxy. And also, you know, some glowing clouds of, um, of, of gas as well. So amazing. Um, okay, so I have a question, me okay. personally, Meredith. Uh, so 
you know, we can see the Milky Way from out when we zoom out, but we can also see the Milky Way from on Earth, right? And can we talk a little bit about that and what that would look like for the uh, collision? Like, what will we see with our eyes from on Earth? Absolutely. Let's check out that collision. Okay, cool. now this first, this is gonna go as a video a little bit quickly, but notice there's a little fuzz patch. Astronomers love fuzz patches, right? <laughs> there's a tiny little fuzz patch, which in the next view you will see is getting larger and larger. And what we're going to be looking at here is a few stills of, of what's happening over the next 5 billion years or so as Andromeda galaxy gets closer and closer to us. This is when the Andromeda galaxy has now hit right, with the Milky Way, and the stars are, are, are dancing around each other, and the gas is clashing together, probably forming some bright new stars, and at the end of this process, you don't see that band of light, the Milky Way anymore from Earth, you don't see the, um, you know, uh, in individual bright blue stars concentrated in that band, and you don't see the Andromeda galaxy anymore, because we have become one, Two galaxies have become one galaxy. And notice when you look up at the end of this is what you see is this sort of um, uh, very uniform spherical pattern of stars because now we are an elliptical galaxy. Okay? <gasps> we went from being two spirals to one elliptical. Okay, so, okay, that has me, that makes me have questions about other elliptical galaxies and like what they used to be. Um, uh, but why don't we just take a quick little pause and oh, actually, you know what, why don't we look at the, uh, what it looks like from space to see these two uh, collide and then we'll take a pause. Sure, um, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to show that because um, from our own point of view, it's difficult to get like a um, to see exactly what's happening, right? Because we're in the middle of the process. But this is a simulation of the same activity that we just saw is going to happen to, to, to the Milky Way and Andromeda. These are two spiral galaxies that are about to merge. Okay, it's nice and slow, right? Build up the suspense. But you can see we have two separate galaxies, right? They are on a collision course. The gravity between them is pulling them together. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to say that this is this beautiful um, simulation, this metamorphosis. Uh, the first time I saw this, was John Dubinsky, who, who made this, was presenting at a conference in Canada when I was um, a graduate student still, I think, and I, my mind was just blown. I was absolutely blown away. Now, what you can see is once these galaxies have started to pass each other, the stars feel the gravitational pull of all that mass that's behind them, and they sort of fling out into these beautiful, what astronomers call, tidal tails, okay? So what you're seeing in the blue colors are these groups, regions of stars that are getting flung around and falling back down to the main gravitational potential well. Notice also that there's some difference in color here. Those red colors are, um, they represent older stars, uh, stars where there's maybe could be a lot of dust there. And you see that the blue is really kind of on the edge. And these galaxies, when they collide, they don't, you just don't have, you don't have like two spirals that boom flat you know like two pancakes smashed together that's not what happens right, these right, galaxies right. dance around each other for quite a while losing stars flinging them a lot flinging them off of each other and eventually will settle into one system and as to the question before right like imagine that as you're watching this it you know from our point of view it looks like oh there's so many stars they're so close they've got to collide but it's the star light we're looking at and there's actually probably hardly any star to star collisions in this entire process. Wow. <laughs> so let me just, um, as we're looking at the final few seconds here, let me just say that my, these galaxy mergers seem to be really important across the whole universe and um, even in dense regions, dense regions of galaxy clusters. And my topic of, of interest are today's largest galaxies. Um, Guess what shape they are? Guess what shape they always are, Meredith? Um, I'm just based on like what we've been talking about. I'm just going to guess elliptical. They're elliptical. <laughs> They're elliptical. They're always, always elliptical. And that leads us to ask how important is this merging of galaxies in building up this type and building up these largest elliptical galaxies? Are they large because they've had the largest number of mergers? Because they started merging earlier than the rest? Are they still merging today? Those are the kind of questions that uh, me and my students are trying to, to uncover. 
so amazing. And it's cool that you can use the information you're gathering from looking at other galaxies to, to predict, you know, uh, and show us that view of what it will look like on Earth and predict like what our galaxy will one day be. Um, I hope to live that many billions of years so I can see it for myself. <laughs> yeah, our son probably will. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Um, okay, cool. We do have a couple of other questions here. Charlie Gambin from the UK, hey, wants to know what proportion of galaxies are likely uh, to collide? Oh, um, well, let's see. That depends a little bit on where the galaxy lives uh, in the universe. Does it live in this dense cluster of galaxies like we're going to talk about in the next part of the show? Um, or does it live in the field? Um, but let's see, uh, that's also a very active area of research. And we don't have the observational data to really be able to say that yet. So for the most part, we're turning to cosmological simulations of what mm -hmm. can happen. But to, so, but we think that mergers are, are super important, are, are fundamental to how galaxies change. And even to put it in perspective, like our Milky Way, which is still a spiral galaxy, appears to have already undergone uh, at least a merger in its past, okay? So um, in my, yeah, yeah. So it sort of depends on what slice of the universe you're talking about. Are you talking about now what fraction will undergo collisions or in the past? And collisions seem to have been, especially for my type of galaxy, these large ellipticals, much more prominent in the past even though they appear a little bit today right right so very important is the answer without a number which is interesting because we're still working on it well I mean we all just saw like leaving the earth how long it takes before you even see another star and then like zooming out even further and I think we're going to zoom out even further later to see just how many galaxies are I mean it's just countless so many things to keep track of and look at and then you like take into consideration that you're looking back in time because of how far away things are so much to think about oh my gosh we have so many questions coming in this is exciting um and i do actually i know that you're going to want to answer this one luis uh okay. um also charlie gamblin from the uk wants to know are those simulations available to view online and i know the oh. one that we just showed meant, means a lot to you Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so um, John Dubinsky is the name of the uh, uh, professor who created that video I actually sh showed. And there might be a link, I think, in there somewhere be where, where we have the credits, because that video is actually totally available on YouTube. So if you Google like John Dubinsky metamorphosis, you can find his videos. And there's actually tons. There's lots of work that's done both um, uh, in many different ways, like adding different layers of real physics, like including the gravity, but also including gravity and how how the um, gas changes as it smashes together and heats up and cools down and forms stars, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so there's lots of those out there. Oh my gosh. Okay, we have a few more questions. I Okay, I'm trying to pick and choose which one. Woo. Um, okay, uh, so we have some folks who are asking about the spinning shape. Um, somebody from Sweden, Izzy from Sweden wants to know about that spinny shape, but I want to like mix that <laughs> question also with um, the proportions of galaxies. Uh, so Jeff Greenspan is, is talking about Andromeda having more stars than Milky Way. Um, mm -hmm. Does that affect things and how they collide and everything? So um, maybe you can answer both of those. To do more. something with that? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let me start with the first one because it's clear in my head. Um, yeah. uh, the, it is true that the milk, the, um, the Andromeda is actually a little bit more massive than the Milky Way. It has a few more stars, although in my scale, in the, in the scale of what I'm about to talk to, uh, talk about, uh, the, 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 today's largest galaxies, they're of order exactly the same. Okay. So, so keep that in mind. It's true that it's a little bit different, but it's not uh, hugely different or as uh, as an astronomer might say an order of magnitude difference if you've heard that terminology mm -hmm. um, but uh, what really drives the semi uh, the collision and how long it will take and all that kind of stuff fundamentally what drives it is the gravity okay how much total mass there is and the super interesting thing about that is that the stars are just showing us like um a little bit of a lighthouse on top of the ocean of the gravity the gravity the ocean is mostly caused by can you guess dark matter dark matter, dark matter okay i didn't give you time to guess <laughs> but uh, dark matter okay so it's really how much dark matter andromeda has versus um, the Milky Way has. 
okay? And that's what drives how long the simulation, uh, how long the merger would take in real life too, how long the merging will take. And then the stars, they get um, flung off, right? And then how they fall back down also is driven by the total, including dark matter, mass of the system. So when you see those beautiful, um, you could kind of imagine it like this, like imagine um, being like an Olympic gymnast um, who had the kinds that have that do that rope uh you know the ribbon dancing yes right? you're spinning around you're driving you're the dark matter you're driving that rope which is the stars that are just flinging around right following the dance that you are controlling so that's what you're seeing when you see those stars flinging off in these beautiful um tidal tales oh, izzy from sweden i hope that you love that beautiful visual of a ribbon dancer to help try and answer your question oh my gosh and then one more question just Totally going off of what you've been talking about, uh, Paul Alter wants to know if the expanding universe might impact uh, Andromeda and how it interacts with the Milky Way. I love that question, okay? Mm -hmm. Because that question tells me that you already know a lot about our universe, right? You already know a lot about um, um, galaxies and galaxy evolution and probably know about clusters of galaxies and all that type of thing. But for those of you who don't know this yet, okay, um, it is, you've probably heard of the Big Bang. And a result of the Big Bang is that the universe is getting bigger and bigger and bigger every day. It's, that's what we say is expanding, okay? That's been seen directly. It's been observed because um, the further away that we look, the faster all the galaxies are moving away from us. And also, except for Andromeda, a couple other dwarfs that we're in a collision course with, everything is moving away. So that's the answer to your question, is that everything is moving away except for that material that is closest enough to enough to us that our mutual gravity exceeds exceeds <sighs> what is needed to be caught in the expansion of the universe. So like for example the universe is expanding but my my cells aren't moving away from each other, right? <gasps> because the forces in my body are keeping all my cells nice and tight, right? I'm not floating off the earth because the universe is expanding because the gravity between me and the earth is enough to to be more important. And the same is true all the way up to galaxy collisions. The, the, the gravity between those galaxies is more important than the expansion of the universe. Oh my goodness. Are we all loving these answers? I, this is, Luis, you're one of my favorites. I don't tell anybody else. <laughs> um, okay. Well, it's a good thing this isn't being recorded. Oh yeah, it's definitely not going to live on YouTube forever. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, we do need to take a pause now because I have to mention some things. First of all, if anybody is just joining us, my name's Meredith. This is Professor Luis Edwards, and we are talking about galaxies, and uh, we're getting down into it. Okay, so we've left Earth. We're like looking at just our uh, neighborhood of galaxies, us and the Andromeda. But um, we are going to talk about some bigger stuff in a minute. But I do want to just say uh, this is Adler Astronomy Live. And if anybody is uh, thinking about donating to the Adler, we would appreciate it so much because your donations are helping us to keep our museum alive and open since it's been closed for the last nine months to the public um, and to help us keep programs like this happening. And we've been we've set this goal of raising $50,000 before the end of the year. And we are almost there. We're at $45,000. So thank you all so much, everybody who has donated so far. It means so much to us. Um, and I'm also going to be giving a shout out to two right now. That is Linda Saucedo. I hope I pronounced that correct. And Stacy Reichartzer. Hope I pronounced that as well. Uh, thank you so much to Linda and Stacy. You are helping us to stay open and stay relevant and uh, keep programs coming to you and help educate actually even more people than before because you know YouTube reaches the world. Um, so any amount is welcome if anybody else is thinking about donating. Maybe it's $1,703 for the name of the galaxy cluster we are about to discuss. That's right, galaxies cluster just wait, your mind is gonna be blown. Um, or maybe it's just $1 for the largest galaxy in the cluster, because there can always only be one, one largest. Um, any amount is welcome. We are so appreciative to you. Thank you again for helping us to reach our goal, because I, th I think we're gonna reach it. We're almost there. Um, all right, let's dive back in. Do, do, do. So now we all understand what a galaxy is. Um, you've given the most thorough and amazing explanation ever. Uh, and also how important uh, collisions are between galaxies. Um, let's talk a little bit more about your specific research, Luis. Uh, so you study galaxy clusters. Can you just tell us a little bit about what those are? Absolutely. Okay, so um, just imagine, keep 
um, keeping zooming out from that we are here in the Milky Way video, what you would see is, as we have seen, Andromeda in the Milky Way. You'll see a few other small galaxies called dwarf galaxies that are nearby our local group. And um, galaxies are often found, not all alone in the universe, but with one or two others or a few others, 10, 20, in what we call a group or in massive clusters with like hundreds of galaxies all swirling about um, the same gravitational potential. Okay, so for example, here's a beautiful image of one that is very creatively called Abel 1703. Well, Abel was um, a catalog named after a person <laughs> who, who found a lot of these. And um, you can see with your eyes, what you're looking at is every, clump of light you see isn't a star anymore. It's an entire galaxy of stars, right? You're wow. looking at millions of or billions of stars all together in one of these clumps. And you can see that these galaxies don't have only empty space around them, but there's other nearby galaxies, right? And in fact, they are interacting. So this is a still, but you could imagine a video of this, which would should be showing the galaxies um, moving or orbiting around each other, some of them merging with each other, right? It's, you know, a lot of activity on the time scale of several billion years. <laughs> okay, but what I hope you notice is that one of these galaxies is in fact the brightest galaxy, right, of this cluster. Scores are near the middle there. There's actually a lot of really important fe um, details in this image here, but kind of near the middle there, there's that what I would call red, and my students have pointed out is actually yellow, but to an astronomer that is red, one red galaxy that's elliptical in shape, it's not a spiral, and is very bright compared to the, all the others. So we call these brightest cluster galaxies. And this type of galaxy is really the most massive, brightest, type of galaxy in our local universe. Um, and they're almost always found in the core of massive clusters. So this is like their house that they usually live in, in these galaxy clusters. Um, uh, in fact, they are not just bright, but also large. And the Milky Way would maybe be about one tenth the size of this behemoth in the middle. In the middle. Unreal. So, I mean, as y'all saw, we left Earth, took forever before we passed another star, <laughs> and then zoomed out even farther. We could see our galaxy is made of hundreds of billions of stars. And then to zoom out and then think about all those galaxies together. I mean, I don't know how many galaxies were in that cluster, but, or how big, you know, some clusters get, but I mean, just amazing to think of the possibilities for each of those galaxies having hundreds of billions of stars who knows what kind of planets are going around each of those stars makes my mind excited um <laughs> okay so uh let's see some of your telescope images Luis, and things that you've seen with a telescope sure yeah well okay well actually the instruments that i use do not bring back a picture um exactly but instead bring back a light signature from the galaxy um, that we call a spectrum, okay? So you can see this very nicely in this cartoon image made by my amazing student, Angela, whose picture is shown at the bottom, um, where you see how this, the, the yellowish light from the center and the bluish light from the outside, they, they, they're shown to, um, they're illustrated coming out of the galaxy and then you see this rainbow, okay? Mm -hmm. So a spectrum is really a technical term for a rainbow. And uh, if you take white light or some you know, sample of light and you break up its constituent colors through like a raindrop or a prism, the result is this rainbow technical term spectra. Now, spectra are super interesting and very important for astronomy because if you look in detail at these spectra as Angela has beautifully illustrated illustrated to us, you see little bumps and wiggles. So you see like a tiny little bit of the green is a little bit darker than be it should be. It's kind of missing. And these are called absorption lines. And this is a direct uh, pairing between the light and gas that the light is going through. So in fact, it tells us the chemical composition, like exactly what materials, hydrogen, helium, carbon, are found in the gas in deep space. So it's super important. And that's really what we use for our, um, our work. You could also get the movement of stars from these uh, spectra as well. This is amazing. And also I can tell that Angela is amazing for making that visualization for us she to look is. at. Yes, she's super amazing. In fact, all of my students are super amazing. <laughs> yeah, I can tell, I can tell. Um, okay, 
So, oh, here we go. Yes, I did. I did want to take a moment to mention my some of my amazing students. I've been lucky to work with uh, dozens of students, both when I was at Yale and um, now at Cal Poly. And actually, so I'll just describe these figures. The one at the top is a beautiful picture that I took when I was observing uh, with some students to get some of our data from Kit Peak. Okay, so as you can see, Kit Peak is has all of these different telescopes on the top of this mountain in Arizona, and we were lucky enough to use, uh, in particular, the Wind Telescope to take this data. And there's a couple other pictures there of um, some students on the left taking uh, uh, their work, their poster of bright cluster galaxies. You might be able to spot one in the poster to present at the. American Astronomical Society meeting in Hawaii last January. And then just a, a shot of uh, some of my, uh, of, of one iteration of my group uh, when we were presenting our posters um, at a Cal Poly poster day. So unreal. And I can't help but notice that um, one of your students looks a little young. Uh... In that picture. Yes. yes, that's my daughter Willow. Uh, hi, Willow. She is getting started really early, as you can see. And in fact, my son Skylar getting started uh, even sooner uh, as yet to be born here. <laughs> so, hi, Skylar. Wow. <laughs> yes, it's a family affair. <laughs> I mean, there's something that we've learned in past Adler Astronomy Lives, which is that it's really hard to get telescope time. And it's amazing that Skylar got telescope time before he was even born. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, man. He's the star. They're both stars. Absolutely. Actually, you know, Meredith, could we um, just, I guess, I, talking about my daughter reminded me, her and my husband picked out these earrings for me, which are little crescent moons. And we noted, noticed right before this call, right, that we had matching moons. Maybe yes. Cool. <laughs> and I don't have a daughter, but I have a mom. And these are my mom's old earrings. Mom, I don't know if you even know that I stole these forever ago, but I think Ooh. these are from like the 80s. <laughs> Truth comes out. Truth's coming out on the show. Truth, mother-daughter love. I love that. Ah, okay. Um, amazing. So I know that you said that you don't, your images that you gather um, aren't really like pics, but do you have some pics to show us? Because like yeah. pics or it didn't happen. You know okay. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah. So I mean, these, the galaxies that we study are some of the most well studied in, in the local universe. And here I've collected some images from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The names of the different galaxy clusters are shown at the bottom, A for Abel, you know, Abel 407, for example. And you, you know, you can do this with your eyes, you're experts now, you can pick out that brightest galaxy. That's the one we look at, the brightest one roughly near the middle. And each of these are in its own galaxy cluster, okay? So each of these little postage stamps are like many, many light years from each other. Um, I did want to mention though that the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is, by the way, free and open to the public for citizen scientists. So any of you are welcome to go type these names in and go explore yourself. Um, and I actually wanted to also make sure that I mentioned that when we go and collect our um, our, teles our data at the telescope, that the undergrads that I work with are, are fundamentally important to this process. They're helping me at the telescope. They're helping me um, uh, re uh, what we call reduce the data, which means make it pretty so that you can study it. Um, they help uh, literally make it pretty like Angela to, to show it into a digestible way. And they they work out the actual science. They look for the trends. It's, 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 uh, it's one of my great joys. <laughs> okay. Um... I have uh, something to say to Jeff Greenspan, who's been sending in tons of questions that I don't even like understand what these questions are. Um, Jeff, you should go check out the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and just like scroll that thing for hours because you obviously know your stuff. I will ask one of Jeff's questions really quick. Um, so, well, actually, hold on. I have two questions that I'm gonna mix together. King Darius 2100 wants to know how big our local cluster of galaxies is. Um, and then also Jeff Greenspan wants to know uh, how fast galaxies are moving away from each other versus how fast galaxy clusters are moving away from each other. So yeah. those are two different questions I know, but I like mixing them sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay, so um, uh, the first one was what's our local galaxy cluster, right? So we're actually 
um, not a part of a cluster in the same sense of the ones that I was just showing. Our immediate neighborhood is a galaxy group, but you might know this already that a galaxy group is a small scale that's usually part of a larger scale and that larger scale is a cluster. So um, our local um, super cluster, super, super cluster really, is the Virgo super cluster. So if you've heard of the Virgo galaxy cluster, which is very closest to, I mean, it's the closest galaxy cluster to us, we're on the larger scale, we're part of that same system that they are part of. And um, it's actually only in the last few years that people have mapped our large scale super cluster that includes Virgo and a bunch of other local clusters and it's called Linnea. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right actually, but it's called Linnea. So you can go look that up uh, if you want to have more information. And then the other question I think I remember was about the speeds, the actual speeds towards and away from. Um, okay, so again, the galaxy Gal individual galaxies aren't so much moving away from each other because of the um, uh, uh, um, expansion of the universe, usually uh, <clears throat> like Andromeda and the Milky Way are caught in their own potential. And the speed with which they move is gonna totally be governed by that. Every system will be different because what matters is how massive those two those objects are and how much gravity they have and therefore how fast you can push them together, but I can give you the information you need to calculate a speed yourself. Maybe we use different units. I would use kilometers per second. Maybe you would use miles per hour. I'm not sure, but here's the information you need, okay? Um, the Milky Way and Andromeda will collide, do their collision in about um, four or five billion years. So that's the time. And right now the distance to the milk, the distance to Andromeda I think is a couple hundred million light years away, something wow. like that. We need to look that up after. How about this? You look up the difference between the Milky yes. Way and Andromeda, and that's the distance, right? And then to get the speed, you just take speed, velocity is distance per time, and take the distance and divide it by the time. Um, and then, so, um, and then again, it's just really very specific as to what the individual situation of the galaxies that might be colliding towards have in order to get their speed. Um, um, okay, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say unreal. I'm just watching you talk about yeah, these yeah, concepts yeah. that are blowing it, my mind. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna throw a quick number. Like if you wanna talk about a really kind of a local galaxy that maybe is part of its own little group that's moving away from us, something like 12,000 kilometers per second would be something reasonable okay kilometers every second right so fast <laughs> wow. and, so, and then the further away you are the faster the objects are moving appear that appear to be moving unreal um okay so we looked we saw some pics you proved you proved uh and we talked about the sloan digital sky survey please go check it out especially you jeff greenspan um and uh so okay let's talk about what you've learned from these images. How do you take this information and like, what do you derive from it? Uh, just tell us, what, what have you learned? Okay, so what we have used the information for, so again, it's not the images per se, but the spectra, the galaxy spectra, we use these to figure out the chemical composition. And then once we know how, like what the buildup of different chemical elements is, excuse me, that gives us then an idea of the age of the po different populations of stars. And also looking at the spectra, we can get the motions of the stars inside the galaxy. And that gives us an idea of the history of merging in the galaxy and also any nearby galaxies, any nearby companion galaxies that might be merging today, we can get those velocities, how fast they're going. Um, and for the person who asked about for numbers, that's about generally about 200 kilometers per second. Okay, from the data, and from the maps that we make, it seems clear that perhaps that these stars formed in their cores first, okay, at the very heart, at the very cores first, perhaps even the first um, in the universe to form, and that their outer layers built up later. So our data supports this wonderful picture put out in recent years by, for example, um, uh, Toft et al. in a paper uh, puts forward this graphic that 
Um, today's large red elliptical galaxy, almost devoid of new star formation, was very different in the past. Probably, so we're going to look at this figure from the left to the right. Probably it started out as two gas rich spiral galaxies. And maybe you can notice what before this talk might have just looked like a abstract painting. But can you tell now that that left image is two spiral galaxies in the process of merging, right? This would have created what we call a dusty nuclear starburst, lots of new stars forming all of the time, but, but hard for us to see from here because all the dust is screening it. Um, this might have ignited an AGN, that stands for active galactic nucleus, which is another word for supermassive black hole that could have spurted out a whole bunch of the other new material that you need to make new stars, leaving a very compact, tight, quiescent, so not forming any new stars, quiet, sort of dead galaxy that then gets puffed up over time with small galaxies merging, adding not too much to the mass, but really a lot to the size into what we have today, today's as today's largest galaxies. And so that is what we've learned. Unreal. And it's amazing that you can look at what to me just looks like a small little speck of light. However, you are able to dissect it and uh, look at it in such a major uh, macro way and derive so much information from it. You know what? I had a really awesome um, piece of advice from a teaching uh, uh, training that I did once, uh, which was hearing that art, an, a well-renowned art history professor started the class by putting up an image, like some art, and then just talking about the image for 20 minutes. And I kind of do that now. Like I, you know, you could put up that image of Abel 1703, don't worry, we're not gonna do it. And I would just talk about that image, you know, for 20 or 30 minutes to get through all of the details with the hope that at the end, you too can notice when we see blue, it means, wow, those stars are brand new. They're young, they're hot. Unreal. And it's just cool to think of how far human beings have come. Cause like our eyeballs can't see those wavelengths, you know, and we had to come up yeah. with some pretty cool tools to figure that out. A bunch of them in space, um, a brand new one that we'll be launching fairly soon, the James Webb Stipface Telescope. That's gonna allow us to see working in the infrared, just like you said, something our eyes can't see. That's gonna allow us to actually test that picture I just showed, the beginning parts, and look at the first galaxies that um, were around in our observable universe and check their properties and see if our guesses match up to the real universe. Unreal. Okay, everybody, I want you all to get your last minute questions ready for Luis. And Jeff Greenspan, you have been so patient. I'm going to try and dive into some of your questions here. And I. <laughs> okay, something that Jeff has been asking about is intergalactic plasma. I don't know what, the <laughs> what plasma is. So, um, and galaxy uh, growth. Um, what, like, do, what is, first of all, can you just tell us what's intergalactic plasma? If you, I mean, I'm assuming, yeah. you know, um, sure. and then how does that affect galaxy growth? Yeah. So plasma that's, um, so you know about, um, solids, liquids, and gases, right? Those phases. Mm -hmm. Plasma is another phase that doesn't get as much attention because it doesn't really happen naturally on earth in these conditions, but, uh, the sun, the, the, the material coming off of the sun is, is, a plasma. So it's basically you get a plasma when you have very gas heated to very high temperatures. Okay. And so that the electrons are kind of running around. All right. So um, a pl if you talk about plasma in terms of space stuff, you're essentially usually talking about um, really hot gas, like maybe like even up to like a million degrees. Okay. Super hot gas. And I don't know, maybe Jeff has, um, has learned a little bit about galaxy clusters, but I will share in, in, in answering his question, but also uh, in a way that I think everybody will be able to follow along, mm -hmm. um, is, is do the largest galaxies have plasma around them? And I'll answer it this way, is that we've seen that beautiful image of Abel 1703 with all the different galaxies. Now, something so amazing about that image about that beyond the fact that there's so much empty space inside the galaxies and outside the galaxies is that there's much more material, not even dark matter, okay? But there's much more material that is invisible to the eye, okay? Um, plasma, hot plasma, this hot, it's basically just hydrogen gas, hydrogen, 
protons running around without their electrons. Their electrons have been stripped off because the gas is so hot, but it bathes the entire cluster. Okay, so that actually, if you counted up all the hydrogen atoms from all the stars, it would be less than all the hydrogen atoms from this loose, hot hydrogen gas around. Okay, so, so um, what we call baryonic material, material that we understand really what it is, is mostly that hot gas. And, but that's not, of course, the end of the story. Dark matter swamps that as well. But mm -hmm. let me, let me, is that okay? Uh, as, yes. as sort of referring Actually, to that question, but not getting too much into the hydro, the, 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 the details of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and really quick, let me add into that. Uh, another question that Jeff had, which I believe ties into dark matter, if I'm remembering from my little brain, right, um, was just about uh, looking back at our own galaxy, the outer rim of stars orbiting in the opposite direction of the rest of the galaxy. Um, does that have to do with Anyway, you can keep going with, uh, you were about to dive into dark matter. So why don't you just dive into it? But I, I think that that ties in, I think, if I remember correctly, um, well, so uh, I'll say this about the orbits and then and then and then maybe we can leave it. But like uh, for now, the uh, spiral galaxies like Andromeda, like the Milky Way, they are really the stars are well described by these um, what we would call planar orbits. All the stars are essentially moving in the same direction around the center of the galaxy. And you have this flat pancake shape to it as well, right? All the stars are confined to this um, sm small vertical area. But in the galaxies like mine, that's not true. In the galaxies like mine, they're puffy, okay? They're three-dimensional. They're very much three-dimensional. Three um, we call them triaxial, okay? They're more like a football or something like that, or really round ones like a, 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 ba a, a soccer ball or something like that. And the, gal the stars in the galaxy aren't all orbiting in the same direction. They're orbiting all crazy, like all the orbits are all very different. And you want to imagine something more like bees going around in a, in a beehive or something like that, okay? They are um, disturbed orbits orbits okay so um so so you wouldn't talk so much for an elliptical galaxy you wouldn't talk so much about whether or not the stars orbit on the outside orbit in a different direction than the inside because they're all the stars are their own thing okay okay amazing and then kevin dahlstead wants to know if anyone's ever estimated how much of the mass of the universe is contained within black holes versus stars planets dark matter um and then they threw out some <laughs> percentages but I'm sure that somebody has, but the numbers that are usually quoted um, are like how much of what we call like, it, the, again, I think I mentioned it before, the fancy word is baryonic mass, but that's a fancy physical word basically to mean that stuff made out of protons, stuff that we understand. How, and um, black holes are included in that. Black holes, planets, dark uh, gas, dust, free dust, all that kind of stuff is all stuff that we really understand what it's made out of, okay? Versus dark matter, which we have some idea of what's going on versus another huge component of the universe, which we're not going to get into today, but some of you have probably heard of before called um, dark energy, okay? And dark energy makes up by far by far most of the universe, like say 70% or something like that. And then dark matter, you know, these are very rough numbers <laughs> and dark matter makes up something more like 20, 25% of that stuff. And the stuff that we understand that we experience, right? Everything you can really think of, planets, stars, black holes, your couch, people, all of water, all of that stuff is just a few percent of the entire, uh, the entire universe. And I'm feeling like I should just double check that pie chart because I might've gotten the numbers wrong, but roughly very little. <laughs> okay, amazing. Well, we are, we're running low on time even though we have so many more questions from our audience here, but I know we wanted to show just a little more zoom out. Um, so Aaron, I don't know if you wanna pull that up. Uh, just, you know, one last trip out into our universe. Okay, cool. So I think this is the Milky Way, getting ready to leave. I still see that little X for you are here. Oh yeah, okay, so let's, so can I walk walk through this with yes, everybody? absolutely, please. Yeah, okay. So, right, so we've hit our galaxy, um, we've passed our galaxy and we are going, uh, 
zooming. We've gone at a very high speed. We've zoomed past our galaxy, the galaxies nearby. And in this illustration, right before we come to that this point, the little dots are individual galaxies. But now in this illustration, when you see these sort of fuzzy clumps, that's not even a galaxy. That's the next level up. That would be a cluster of galaxies, OK? And these clusters of galaxies are separated by real empty space, voids, and connected by filaments of galaxies. And now we've zoomed in a little bit. We're sort of seeing, seeing some galaxy clusters here, maybe two, at, two right beside each other, maybe one really big one. I think we're zooming in again through a lot of empty space to zoom right back in on the Milky Way. And um, do we have time for me to say, I wanted to share one last sort of thought. Do we Absolutely. have time for that? Yes, please. OK. I kind of just wanted to um, end by, you know, think about this video that's currently being shown. Um, and I kind of wanted to end with this idea here is that we aren't seeing the individual billions of stars in these figures, right? They, they, we're seeing so much at the same time that we're not looking at just one star. Okay, we are looking, we, we can't make them out. We're seeing the accumulated, accumulated glow of all their starlight okay but think back to when we talked about the milky way and andromeda collision there's so much empty space between the stars and as one of you asked maybe a handful of stars will collide mostly they'll just move right by each other untouched that's the same with these mega galaxies we're really looking at mostly empty space and each of the stars that glows to make up this light is light years away from the next um and you know and that's just a part of the story we've already hinted about dark matter and dark energy that's just a, a very small part of the story one of the reasons that i love the work that angela did featured here in this image is that she's sort of like you wouldn't see this in a photo but she's sort of um see you can kind of see these little pinpricks of light that represent individual stars or little groups of stars and to me that really gives you the sense that like there's a lot of space in these galaxies as well right just a lot of empty plasma filled dark matter filled space <laughs> unreal this has been so refreshing, especially since we're all stuck at home right now. So we're literally stuck in like the most micro of spaces um, in our lives. Uh, just to remember just how small, you know, our space is compared to like what's out there and just how like far the nearest star is to us, how far we have to travel to see our galaxy, see the next galaxy over. Um, and then just to zoom out like that and look at our universe as a whole, um, it's, it's grounding for me and uh, just a nice reminder. And it's been so awesome talking to you, Luis, because uh, I mean, not only were people, did people have so many questions because of your enthusiasm and obviously your incredible knowledge, reading your bio at the beginning, I'm sure made people go, oh my gosh, this is the person I want to ask all my questions to. Uh, <laughs> but also it just, it was really fun. You know, this has been so fun. Um, this is our last Adler Astronomy Live for 2020. So thank you all so much for an awesome like 2020 experience and, and for us diving into this brand new program as we, uh, you know, experience a pandemic that put us all into our little homes and how amazing it is to be able to still explore our universe with y'all even just from my little dining room table um Luis it has been such a pleasure talking to you today oh thank you thank you so much for having me I had a great time if you couldn't tell <laughs> <laughs> so fun and I don't know do you have a way for folks to contact you on like either Twitter or or whatever I don't know if you normally do that but I know there were a lot of questions that came in that we didn't get to okay right well let's see um I think my webpage will be posted cool. so that probably the best way to get through to me would be through my a professional email, which will be on that um, on that web page. Uh, I'd love to have your questions. You're going to be patient with me because I am on break. <laughs> but um, if you do have more stuff, feel free to uh, absolutely feel free to email me. I have a Twitter. Don't contact me through it because I don't think I've tweeted in five years. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, I love that. Well, I'll, you know, I'll probably send you some questions uh, through our contacts that we have. Um, also, if anybody has any other questions for our Adler experts, please email askadler at adlerplanetarium.org. Um, I promise our experts will get back to you ASAP. Uh, it's amazing. I watch it happen all the time. So if we didn't get to your questions, which Jeff, Greenspan, I mean, your questions are unreal. I can just tell that you're an extremely intelligent person and well 
um, educated in the world of space science. And I learned a lot from you today, Jeff. Uh, so please use Ask Adler. And I think that Jeff is a regular at the and in the Space Visualization Lab too. And if that's true, welcome back, Jeff. And thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and everybody else from all over, I mean, Sweden, the UK, this is so awesome. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, yeah, I mean, subscribe to the Adler's YouTube channel. We have plenty of other programming that's gonna be happening, um, you know, th for the rest of 2020 and beyond. So please check it out. And um, yeah, uh, we, Mike is gonna be sharing, uh, might've shared already the link to donate again. Thank you so much for all your donations. We are so close to hitting our goal. Thank you so much, everybody. We hope that you have a wonderful holiday season and new year, and uh, we'll see you in 2021. Thanks again, Louise. Bye, thanks for having me. Yes, and thank you, Aaron, for those visualizations. And take us out, Aaron. <laughs>